brilliant because I can't hear anything else. Um, it's great to uh, be able to do this this morning. I get more nervous speaking to uh, an iPad in the basement of my house than I do in front of people. I think I like having someone in front of me. Uh, Nicola said she would do it, but I think that'd be a bit awkward, her just standing in front of me in my office, uh, smiling at me. So uh, hopefully uh, it'll go well in the basement. Uh, so this week, I want to continue on um, after um, some of our wonderful ladies. Um, I, a few weeks ago, I spoke about belonging, and then Lila talked about um, being known, and then Amy talked about uh, productivity versus fruitfulness. And what I found with what is being spoke um, on a Sunday, it's very practical and relevant for where we are at or where I'm at anyway. Um, and I, I'm hoping that what I'm going to share this morning again is the same. And this morning I want to talk, uh, I want to entitle what I'm talking about, Talk is Cheap. Talk is Cheap. But straight away my question is, is it? Is talk cheap? Because too many of us, I believe, use words without counting the cost. And so um, I want to begin with a story. But before I do that, I'm going to set my timer. There we go, because try and keep to a good time. Uh, so I was reading through a book this week to help me. I really recommend it. It's called Redeeming How We Talk. And I've based some of the stuff um, that I'm going to share this morning from that book because uh, I found it so valuable. I really wanted to share some of it. So uh, in 1970, in San Francisco, an unknown man walks from his home to the Golden Gate Bridge. His mission is simple, to jump. Passing person after person, tourist after tourist, business after business, the man climbs the bridge's four-foot safety railings. He jumps, falling four or 220 feet to his death. During the course of the ensuing investigation, the man psychiatrist, along with the assistant medical examiner, discovered a note on his writing bureau. It read, I'm going to walk to the bridge. If one person smiles or even talks to me on the way, I will not jump. That was in the New Yorker in 2013 and a true story. A single stranger could have saved a life. Our lives, our smiles, and yes, our words have so much power. Words can begin and end wars. They can inspire. They can bring healing. Uh, they can hurt or they can reconcile relationships. Words can terrorize or words can bring the gospel of peace. So I believe that our words are shaped by our thoughts, um, about ourselves, even our context, so our history that we've had, and uh, the experiences we've had, the feelings we have right now in the moment, um, by our culture. And for Christians, I believe that how we speak um, to others is also influenced by our thoughts of the God that we love and serve. So if you serve a God who is full of wrath and anger and judgment and religious versus a God who is full of love and grace, then is going to dictate how you speak to other people made in his image. Um, Gandhi said, how can so many Christians be so unlike their Christ? And I believe it is because they and we and I have the wrong view of God sometimes, which distorts my words and then my actions. So this morning I want to ask a question, how much time do we, and every time I say we, I mean completely I, because... The reason I'm bringing this is because it's really done something to me. And I'm going to have five, um, five individuals upstairs after this sermon keeping me right all day with what I say. How much time do we spend thinking about and praying about the words that we use, how they shape our lives and how they affect others around us? We speak all day, but we rarely think about what we say. Am I the only one that's guilty of that? Oz Guinness said that when more, uh, when more and more of something is available, it is less valuable. So as Christians, it is our job to steward the words that come out of our mouths. It is our job to place value 
on the words that we say. In Ecclesiastes 5.2, Solomon says, let my words be few. I think he was kind of like me in those moments where you're like, oh, please, God, will you help me to shut up? Or will you help me to stop that? Or will you help me to stop saying that? Does anybody else get those moments? I can imagine Saul where he's just saying, please, God, give me wisdom to know when to be quiet. Because we are meant to count our words, to think over what we're going to say um, and weigh up. So why are words so important? It's conversations that personalize and dignify us. Think about that. The words that come out of your, your mouth um, tell the person that's listening something significant about you and about where you're at, about your values, your language, the conversations that you have tells a lot about you. And uh, I was thinking about the story of the lady at the well. When she encountered Jesus, the words that he used personalized and dignified her so that she went back into her village saying what Lila talked about a couple of weeks ago, I am known. An encounter with Jesus' words moved her from the place of unknown to the place of being known and being a part of something and being loved. That's, that's another sermon. And so the richness of language is God's way of giving us tools to resolve our human relationships, but also uh, to be vulnerable and honest with each other and with God. The writer of this book, A.W. Swoboda, says that words mean we are made in the likeness of God. Words are an essential part of humanity. They help us avoid and resolve conflict, but also to bless God, used also to bless God, bless our neighbours, communicate our feelings and sing out praises and shout for joy. Sometimes those are harder to do, but I love those moments where you're shouting for joy. But where did it all start? The first thing when we open up our Bibles, hopefully it's going to be Genesis there. And the first thing we see God do in Genesis 1 verses 1 to 3 is speak. And it were these words, God said, can anybody, does anybody know? I know we can't interact, but he said, let there be, let there be. So the first thing that I see with words in the whole of the Bible is this, they have the power to create and the power to build. Rabbi Joshua Heschel said this, creation is the language of God and time is his song. So the result of a word from God was that all the light that was ever needed was created. And what comes with light? Life. Life was created out of the words, let there be. Ken Wiesma, the other writer of this book, he says, there was nothing, then there were words, then there was everything. Everything that was ever needed started with the words of God, let there be. God called the world into being. And here's the key. Joshua Heschel says this, and that call goes on today. It's a continuous process. So the key is God started out with the words of let there be, but through the power of the Holy Spirit, you and me, we get to continue in the power of building and creating his kingdom through the words that come out of the overflow of our heart led by the spirit of God. It's still happening today. But the next thing I notice um, about the passage in Genesis is this, less is more. This isn't always easy for me, and especially when I'm preaching. Less is more. Notice it wasn't a massive list and manuscript of the technical things of how the world was going to be built. Maybe there was in the background, we don't know. But all we have is this, let there be. Ecclesiastes 5.2 says, let your words be few. Matthew 12.36 says, we will give account of the words that we say. And James 1.19 says, be slow to speak. And there are reasons for that. The reasons why is this. Words also have the power to destroy. In Proverbs 18.21, it says, your words are so powerful that they will kill or give life. So words can undermine everything that God has done and created. They can build up or they can tear down. And then that leads to the next stage of, of Genesis. So words um, liberate and set free in the hands of God. But in the devil's hands, they tear down. So from creation, the devil, he wanted um, to use words to get his work done as well. And so this is where he does his finest work. Satan means the accuser. And that's what he's loved to do from the very start. So just as God created the world um, with words, the devil manipulates with words. 
Some of his first words were Satan pouncing on Eve. We know the story well. And he asked a deconstructive question. He wanted to tear down what the creator had built with his words. And the question was this, Genesis 3 verse 1, we know it well. Did God really say that? Are you sure that's what he said to you? And then it starts the process of Ronnie's favorite verse, stealing, killing, destroying, manipulating. One writer comments on this, and he says that we moved from God's words in the garden, being forgotten and replaced with Satan's question. He wants you to question everything. I mean, in a negative way, questions in themselves are usually good. But he wants to put those lies into your mind. From here, human relationships, they started to break down. And we had the first marriage uh, fight. Never had those. Adam and Eve uh, have their we fight in the garden. And it becomes more pronounced and more pronounced. And from this first example, we see where God intended his words to create and to build and to free and to establish things. Satan came in and used it for the opposite, to divide, to marginalize, to deconstruct, to put a barrier between God and man. And it seems whatever God does with, whatever God does with words, Satan tries to undo. And hence is one of his other names, the father of lies. So the results are this. After sin, um, Adam and Eve headed to the east of Eden. And then after Cain killed Abel, he headed, to, he headed east to the land of Nod. And then further east of Babel, we all know what happened there. They wandered from what God had established and from his presence. But then later on, we read where God was speaking to Abraham and he invites him once again to come back to him and start out on the journey to the promised land, which is west. Now, geographically in the Bible, that's great. It's that. It was pretty cool when I read that. But what that says to me is still today, we wander farther and farther and farther away because of listening to the lies of the enemy. And all God is doing is saying, come back to me. I'm here. I'm waiting. I am ready. So the lesson is this from that. Listening to the words of the devil displace humanity from the will of God. Listening to the words of the devil displace humanity from the will of God of God. So we've started out with uh, what God has to say about words, but what we want to look at now is what it says through Jesus, because we want everything we do to be through the lens of Jesus Christ. Everything we need to know about God, we see in Jesus. So it says, in the beginning was God and the word was with God. If you were with us on Thursday night, Neil explained this in a lot more depth and better than I will. But what we know is that Jesus is the word. Jesus is the word of God expressed in human life, in human form. And so he embodies all of the original words of let there be. With him comes creation, with him comes fulfillment, with him comes light and life. So with that revelation, I want my words and the words that come out of my mouth, they're not always, but I want them to be. I want them to be flowing from the creator who has my best and your best at heart. Matthew 7, 24 to 27 um, it's that great story. We know the little song, the wise man built his house upon the rock. I can't remember the actions, but I remember it from five day club and stuff. Um, but Jesus says, anyone who listens to my teachings, my words and puts him into practice will build on a solid foundation. The Passion Translation says, listen, whoever listens and applies will build on an unshakable foundation, an unshakable foundation. So are you going to build your life on the words of Jesus or the words of the devil. Words are tools that are given to us to construct and to build with. And they, are, they can be both used in a wise way, building on the rock, or a foolish way, building on the sand. Now, I got a, um, what do you call that, a toolkit? don't even know the name for it. I got a toolkit a while ago, and I have some tools in it. Now, maybe you can put in the comments, I don't have a clue what this is. Does anybody know what that is? Neville, you probably know. Don't have a clue. I'm sure, but this tool in the hands of the right person can be used to do something great. Again, I kind of think I know what this is, but the batteries don't seem to be working. Maybe I need to buy a battery. I don't know. 
But oh, that's for holes in your belt. Good job. We'll try that out. I need I need that with it when I'm on a diet. Don't have a clue what this is for. Maybe someone can tell me. And lastly, does anybody know what this is for? No. I haven't seen this in a while, so I don't know what to do with it. Hopefully soon. But the key is this. Tools need to be taught how to be used. I need to learn some English also. And so with words, we need taught how to use them, how to shape them, how to form them, and where they come from. So the key is this. We all build our lives on words. And so we either build on a trustworthy, true word, or we build on words that are deceptive, that are lacking, that are empty, and that are hollow. So our lives are built or broken by the words we believe, the words we follow, and the words we speak. So literally, we become our words. So I want to ask you this morning, whose words are you listening to? Whose words are you building on? Have you got a solid, unshakable foundation built on who God says you are? Or are you still listening like Eve and Adam did to the words of the deceiver, to the father of lies? Practically this morning, I love to look practically, you know that. Where do we go from here? So to learn to talk to others the way Jesus did, we need to learn how Jesus done that. And for me, it was this. He spent time talking to the Father. The key is he knew who he was before God. That was his solid, unshakable foundation. And so the first practical thing is this. When God said, let there be, does anybody remember uh, what would have been happening around him? I think there would have been complete silence. So God spoke existence into silence, which means this. God needs silence to have a canvas to create beauty on with you and me. Alan Davis says that accurate speech about anything and especially about God is, a fact of, is in fact a rhythm of silence and speech. Ken Wistman, again, the author of this book, he said, solitude is where we learn to hear from God. And through solitude, we come to a healthier place, able to enter external conversations grounded and with abundance to give rather than with an insatiable need to take. Think about that for a minute. Through standing in silence with the Father, it takes away our insatiable need to take when we come around to have conversations with others and places us in a position where we want to give and to listen. And so the inputs that we have significantly, significantly steer the outputs in our lives. So what is the dominant culture that is feeding your mind and your speech? What is the dominant thing that is going on in your head? The first thing we need to do is be attentive to God's voice and to God's presence. As Dallas Willard pointed out, he said, we will never walk like Jesus walked if we do not practice what he practiced. There is nothing sudden about Christ-likeness. The next one is be known for speaking the truth. Now there's context to this. I'm not telling you to go out and just tell everybody what you think of them because that wouldn't be coming from the Father's heart. Um, what I'm trying to say is let your yes be yes. Be people of integrity. Be people that speak truth that is uplifting and uh, giving love. There are times in relationship where we are going to have to, to, to have hard conversations with people, which I'll talk about. But I, what I'm trying to say is get away from society norms because to, to society, truth is an inconvenience. The language of our culture is deceit and lies. Just look at the media. But what we find in the New Testament is that the church there, for them to tell truth, was a part of community. You had to be a part of community. Weber said this about it. People's receptivity to truth is largely connected to clarity of love and long-term commitment to them. Nobody wants truth shots at them from, outs, from the outside with no personal commitment. Now, if you want more information about that, listen to Lila a couple of weeks ago. She'd done a great job about just sitting listening. Um, but here's a key that I find helpful to, to me. Jesus gave truth and then he gave himself. So the question is this, when you give truth to people, 
in love, in commitment, in community, are you willing then to give yourself to them? Are you willing to share in their experience and commit to whatever they are going through if you think you can give input to their lives? The next thing is this. How can we engage in life-giving speech? That's one of the keys to the prophetic. The prophetic is to build up and encourage. And I really believe um, the most basic uh, form of, of the prophetic is just telling people the amazing things that you see in them that they do, that they say who they are. Um, how can we engage in life-giving speech? What habits are informing the way that you speak to others? Um, I would encourage you to move away from society norms where some speech is just full of nonsense and doesn't go anywhere. I would encourage you to listen to other voices within community, within uh, the church that you're a part of, whatever it may be. Wendell Berry said, it's not from ourselves that we learn to be better than we are. It's in community that we are going to learn how to engage in life giving speech. Do you ever have, know of that person that you know they won't listen to the gossip that you're saying or negative things that you're saying? They'll, it, they'll change the whole conversation with a couple of words and you'll think, oh, why do I keep doing that? Why do I speak like that? I'm sure we all have a friend like that. So uh, can I encourage you to talk about what you're reading, to talk about what you're listening to, to help engage in life giving speech. And in the middle of that, can I encourage you um, to be careful with how you talk to yourself? Because there's a lot of power in self-talk. Do you know that 70% of the words that you use are to yourself? If you're more than 70%, I'm, more, I'm a wee bit worried about you. You might need to talk to someone. 70%. So how do you talk to yourself? It's very important. The next thing is this, use our words for good to bring up conversations about those in the margins. What do I mean about this? Here's a, here's a quote that sums it up. Dorothy Day said that we must talk about poverty because people insulated by their own comfort lose sight of it. We all live in the developed world where we have privilege and it's our job as followers of Jesus to use that privilege um, to talk about justice, to talk about the orphan and the widow. We know that we're a church that pushes for fo uh, fostering and adoption, but we need to use our words, our influence, to bring up conversations about those who are on the margins. I think we could probably do a whole other sermon on that, or someone could. Can I encourage you to start each day asking the Holy Spirit to guide your words? Put your device down long enough to engage in conversations and when I was writing that down I, I put in brackets make an effort in these days especially when you're out we could encounter someone at the shops who has been inside all week and hasn't talked to one soul and maybe you could be that person like the story at the start who has one conversation or one smile and it completely changes that person's day so can I encourage you when you're out at the shops or whatever it is on that one time that you're allowed out unless you're working yeah, stick to the law of the land, that you take your, your head out of your phone and try to engage in conversation or just smile, whatever it may be, at people. You know, the technology has increased our communication capacities, but it has also decreased our attentiveness and our ability to communicate with people that are at arm's reach. This week, try and put the phone down. And that goes on to the next one. Create conversational space. Can I encourage you to learn to ask questions? I'm really bad at this. Do you know who's really good? Neil, he can maybe give you some and uh, Neville. They could do a class on it someday. Um, create conversational spaces. Learn to ask questions. Learn to listen and pay attention. And here's the key with your whole body. Um, one writer said that embodied speech is the highest form of communication. Uh, I've just ordered a book this week, What Everybody is Saying, um, by a guy who was an FBI agent, and it, it gives you insights into people's body language. So that'll be interesting when I get back to preaching, you're all sitting in front of me, I'll be able to know if you're engaging or not. Um, but we need to listen with our whole bodies, not just our ears. Uh, when we learn other people's stories and backgrounds, it helps us understand and relate to that person. Uh, more than we could if we weren't listening. It's so important to listen to the background 
of stories. Be curious about people. Be curious in your conversation. And I can I encourage you in this day, do not be afraid to have difficult conversations. Be open with people about your story and give them space um, to do the same. I believe that now more than ever, we need our friends and family. And um, Martin Luther King Jr. said, in the end, we will not remember the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. And the reason I'm saying that is because I want to encourage you to not let fear hold you back. Um, I know that many of us on this call, we know someone who has lost someone during COVID. And maybe you're nervous about what to say in a message or a conversation with them. That's what I'm saying this, this quote for. People are going to remember what their friends didn't say in these times rather than what they did. Um, or sorry, they're going to remember their silence. And so I encourage you, um, if you need to pick up the phone to a loved one that you haven't spoke to or a friend that you've fallen out with or someone that you need to say sorry to, now is the time to do it and don't hold back. Um, if you were on the call this week, Nicola said about how um, she valued the opportunity that she had to say a few things to James um, last month about how she felt about him and what he inputted to her life. Her life. And so I encourage you in this crazy time that if you know someone that you really feel you need to do that to, do it today. Tell them how you value them. Tell, you, tell them the input that they've had in your life, the difference that they've made. And again, Ken Wasteman said, difficult conversations composed of well-chosen words um, and space to consider new thoughts is a way we can pursue wisdom and challenge ourselves to more fully walk in the ways of Jesus. It's so important to have those hard conversations and to leave space um, to consider those thoughts. And this is the last one. Be careful what religious language you use so that the gospel is accessible to all. You know, our words are a road, roadway, highway, whatever it may be, um, to Jesus. And so we can either drive people to him or drive them, sorry, lead people to him, there'd be better language, or drive people away from him. And some of us, what I found is we take them around every um, back road in the country, overcomplicating the gospel and overcomplicating Jesus. But I love how Paul done it. He says in 1 Corinthians 9, 19, to a Jew, I became a Jew. To those under the law, I became like one under the law. So what I found is he adapted to his audience, to their culture, to their education, and to their understanding. He began where they were. He stepped into their shoes, which formed his words and his approach to them. And so he thought how his words would affect the others around him and how they would help them on the road to Christ. So can I encourage you to do that in different contexts? You're going to use different language and say different things. And I mean that in a positive way. So can I encourage you this week? This is me finishing off. Can I encourage you just with a few quick practical things? I'm just going to list them. Okay, so get your pens out. Number one, you are your words. Godly speech comes from your heart. It bears the fruit of your heart. So can I ask you this? How does the fruit that's coming out of your mouth taste to the hearer? How does it taste to the person hearing it? Imagine, can I ask you, imagine the exercise this week. For the whole week, you get to wear one of these, see these mics? And it records in the little box. And at the end of this week, everyone in your church family gets to hear your whole week. <sighs> okay, we'll not really do that because we've got grace. But imagine that. How would that shape your words? The second one is this. Speak for the good of others. Focus on the other before you open your mouth. Focus on the other before you open your mouth. Ephesians 4.29 says, And never let ugly or hateful words come from your mouth, but instead let your words become beautiful gifts that encourage others. Do this by speaking words of grace to help them. One thing we found out about James this week is that he was known by all as an encourager. Yes, he was up for the crack, but he was an encourager through and through. He always left people by saying something encouraging to them and blessing them. Can we do that this week? The next one is think about what you say before you speak to others. I think that's kind of the same as the last one. But anyway, sorry, forgive me. Speak to carry other people's loads, not add to them. 
the amount of times that I bring stuff to offload and I shouldn't be doing it to that person. We all have someone in life. They're the person that we use as a lightning rod. It's great to have them. We need them. But try this week not to load people down with burdens that they don't need. Number six, our words must be matched by our actions or they are empty. You know that actions are the words. Actions are words come alive. So can I encourage you, I encourage you with your words, think of gardening. When you're gardening, you're doing it. You're doing stuff to the land, to the soil, to bring life and to bring growth. If it's not doing that, be careful what you're saying. Start the day by asking the Holy Spirit to lead your words and guide your words. And lastly, and then you can give me an amen. Can I encourage you? I read something this week. I've got another book coming. It's called The Yes And Principle. And I thought this would be fun to practice. Um, can I encourage you to start the yes and principle within your conversations? And um, there are some of them I encourage you not to use it with. Um, somebody asks you to do something bad, you don't say yes, no problem, and what else? Um, it, it's to encourage more questions and conversations. Yes, and tell me a little bit more. Yes, and how did that go for you? It encourages you to go deeper in the conversations instead of saying no, but this is what I think. Um, so that's me for today. Hopefully um, you've understood all that. I can put the uh, PDF document of my notes up if that helps you a little bit. Um, and to finish off again in remembrance of James, we'll see you after. Have a good day and enjoy whatever you're doing. God bless.